first mail centre. 1809, convict Isaac Nichols designated as Australia's first postmaster. Stamp showing Australia's first postmaster, Isaac Nichols, boarding transport in Sydney. For the convicts, pilgrims and authorities showing up in the early settlement of New South Wales, letters were the best way to keep an association with Britain. Boats showing up in Sydney were mobbed by individuals searching for mail. Misrepresentation, robbery and blackmail were overflowing. On the 25th of April 1809 the public authority designated Isaac Nichols to the situation of postmaster. Nichols, a previous convict, assumed responsibility for the dissemination of mail inside the settlement and set up the first mail centre in quite a while home. Sydney Gazette, the 30th of April 1809. Objections having been made to the Lieutenant Governor, that various frauds have been submitted by individuals fixing on board ships, on their landing in this port, and personating others, by which they have gotten ownership of letters and parcels to the extraordinary injury of those for whom they were proposed. Letters. Letters. In late January 1788 the first fleet showed up in Botany Bay. For those building up the province, the feeling of separation would have been gigantic. In June 1790 the second fleet cruised into Sydney Cove, carrying with it valuable freight, letters from home. In depicting the appearance, marine official Watkin Tench composed, letters, letters, was the cry. They were delivered, and torn open in shuddering tumult. News burst upon us like meridian wonder on a visually impaired man. Early British Post. In Britain an incorporated postal help was set up in 1512. Lord Henry VIII's knight of the main expert of the posts in 1516, a position answerable for building up postal administrations in towns across Britain. By the late 18th century the postal framework was a public and bound together help, with letters being conveyed in male mentors by staff in uniform. Post in the early state. The appearance and dissemination of mail in the early long stretches of the state was tumultuous. The soonest recorded proof of mail conveyance shows up in the Sydney Gazette on 10 July 1803. The declaration approved boatmen going among Sydney and Parramatta to charge for the conveyance of letters, selective of government service, every two pence. Like Britain at that point, there was no arrangement of prepayment. The beneficiary of the letter was obliged to pay for its conveyance. It was a heedless cycle. Sending a letter abroad required a combination of karma and resolve. The sender would have to hang tight for a leaving transport and endow the letter with the boat skipper. There were no insures that it would be conveyed. First mail center. As the number of inhabitants in the province developed, so did the volume of approaching mail. At the point when boats showed up in Sydney Cove they were mobbed by individuals looking for letters and packages. By 1809 there were raising protests to the Lieutenant Governor of misrepresentation, burglary and coercion at the docks. The New South Wales Corps, which had dismissed Governor Bly in 1808, moved to get control over the disarray by naming an authority postmaster. On the 25th of April 1809 Nichols, a liberated convict, was designated as postmaster, a place that approved him to board dispatches and get letters and packages addressed to individuals inside the state. He was requested to set up an office at his home in George Street, where letters could be gotten and the assortment costs would be fixed. On the 26th of June 1809 Isaac Nichols boarded the Brig Experiment and gathered the principal sack of mail from Britain. This is perceived as the introduction of the postal framework in Australia. Isaac Nichols. Isaac Nichols was brought into the world on the 29th of July 1770 at Count, Wiltshire, England. At 21 years old he was seen as blameworthy of taking and condemned to seven years transportation. Nichols showed up in Port Jackson on the 16th of October 1791. Nichols was dedicated and had the most extraordinary of convict characteristics, moderation. His genuineness and perseverance dazzled Governor Hunter, who selected Nichols as the chief overseer of convict packs in Sydney. In 1797 Nichols finished his sentence and Governor Hunter allowed him 50 sections of land, 20 hectares, of land in the Concord locale. The ascent of Isaac Nichols was brilliant. In 10 years, he expanded his property possessions to 1400 sections of land, 566 hectares, opened a motel on George Street, set up a shipyard and constructed the Governor Hunter, a 33-ton exchanging clipper. By 1806 Nichols was perhaps the richest finance manager in the province. Photograph of straightforward two-story, working with two men and a pony and truck out the front. The main Sydney Mail Centre. First stamp. On the 23rd of June 1810 Governor Macquarie endorsed the arrangement of Isaac Nichols as postmaster and Nichols home turned into the main mail centre in the settlement. Around 1812 Nichols made a stamp that read, Sydney New South Wales. Albeit undated, these stamps are viewed as the antecedents of the stamp in Australia. As postmaster, Nichols gathered the approaching mail and distributed a rundown of individuals who had gotten mail in the Sydney Gazette. Nichols set the costs for gathering mail and kept the income as compensation. 
The expense of gathering mail was one peddling for a letter, and up to five shillings for an enormous package. Nichols hand conveyed mail to the most powerful individuals in the settlement. The mailing station was run as a personal business until 1825 when the New South Wales Legislative Council passed the Primary Postal Act. This moved postal administrations to the governor, who decided a postmaster's pay and set the costs for mail assortment. The Postal Act likewise approved the governor to choose postmasters outside of Sydney. Postal administration spread. The main postmaster was designated in Van Diemen's Land, Tasmania, in 1812, and mail was brought from Sydney in fixing and whaling ships. Postmasters were named in the Swan River State, Western Australia, in 1829, Victoria in 1836, South Australia in 1837 and Moreton Bay, Queensland, in 1842. In 1828 the main mailmen started direct conveyance in Sydney. Peripheral settlements were overhauled by project workers riding a horse or in mentors. Postal Administrations and Alliance Every one of the settlements worked their own postal assistance until they were joined at Federation. From 1901, every single postal help and broadcast communications were worked by the Postmaster General's Department. In 1974, these administrations were parted, with the Media Communications Administration becoming Telecom, presently Telstra. Postal administrations turned into the Australian Postal Corporation, presently Australia Post. The postal framework has extended with the developing populace and mechanical changes. From humble beginnings with an optimistic convict, Australia Post presently conveys 2.6 billion letters each year. History Australia Post's origins can be traced back to 1809, when former convict Isaac Nichols was appointed as the nation's first postmaster and opened a post office in his house in George Street, Sydney. Nichols was responsible for collecting the mail from newly arrived ships. Tasmania also established an early postal service in 1809, with a dedicated post office established in Hobart in 1812. The more formal commercial origins of Australia Post, however, lie in the first Postal Act of 1825, which enabled the New South Wales Governor to fix postage rates and appoint postmasters outside of Sydney. Postal services were an important feature of Australian life from the early colonial period, given their role as the only means of contact between Australia and Britain for much of the 19th century. Postal offices were also among the first infrastructure developed in each new colony and town. In 1849, the Australian colonies banded together to establish uniform postage rates and to try and achieve greater regularity in their services across borders. Between 1860 and 1900, in the lead up to Federation, a large number of inter-colonial conferences were also held to discuss ways of making postal services and communications more efficient and cooperative. The need to provide a common and uniform system of communications between the colonies was one of the key drivers behind Federation, and in 1900 the heads of each postal department met in Sydney to thrash out the integration of the separate colonial postal services under the new Commonwealth. The Commonwealth Post and Telegraph Act was passed in June 1902, and a National Postmaster General's Department, the PMG, was established, with responsibility for the nation's mail and telephone services. The PMG amalgamated the various colonial services, and some 5,000 existing post offices were placed under the control of the new department. Shortages in funds and resources, however, meant that maintenance of existing buildings, and construction of new postal buildings, generally remained the responsibility of the various states up until the 1920s, although the PMG was more active in construction in New South Wales and Victoria before this time. New postal and telegraph offices were also a significant addition to city and country centres, and were frequently the first physical manifestation of the new Commonwealth Government. In 1975, the old PMG was replaced by a structure whereby responsibility for telephone and mail services was divided into the Australian Postal Commission, Australia Post, and the Australian Telecommunications Commission, formerly Telecom, now Telstra. Heritage Places Australia Post currently owns approximately 520 places, and leases an additional 700 places. These places include a rich and diverse range of heritage properties which are geographically dispersed across Australia, and comprise historic buildings from the colonial era, through to post-Federation and more recent, post-World War II, structures. These buildings are used for the delivery of various postal and related services, including for administrative and retail purposes. Australia Post also owns properties that are leased out for other, non-postal related purposes. The properties include grand and imposing public buildings, such as the general post offices GPOs, in most of the state and territory capital cities. Also included are prominent 19th century buildings in the main streets of Australian regional centres, many of which have conspicuous clock towers. More modest early 20th century postal buildings are also included in the heritage portfolio, and are distinctive buildings within their streetscapes and urban contexts. 
All of these buildings also have, to a greater or lesser degree, social value in heritage terms, whereby they are valued by their local communities for both the services they offer, or have offered in the past, and often too for their architectural and built form qualities. Changing technologies have also resulted in changes to postal buildings. The introduction of telegraph offices and telephone exchanges in the second half of the 19th century brought about alterations and extensions to many existing postal buildings. Changes in mail handling in the 20th century have also physically impacted on postal properties, and resulted in the construction of new types of postal buildings. Since the 1980s, many existing postal buildings have been altered to accommodate a change in focus to a more commercial or retail style of postal service, while new outlets have been opened away from the traditional main street context, in the new and larger shopping centre complexes. As a result of these trends, many of Australia Post's older properties have become redundant, in some cases leading to their divestment. This heritage strategy will assist Australia Post in managing heritage places within its portfolio, including managing further change to heritage buildings, and ensuring the Commonwealth heritage values are protected in the divestment process.